Hello and welcome to everyone who has joined us today for our last event in a week-long series of sector-specific careers conversations in partnership with Skills East Sussex. My name is Sarah Hinks from Culture Shift. We're a charity that builds dynamic partnerships combining culture with community, business and education. Today we are welcoming a selection of local East Sussex professionals from the health and social care sector. We're going to kick off with a short film highlighting some key areas of the industry. pandemic shone a spotlight on our health and social care sector and the importance of every single employee frontline or behind the scenes in contributing to the well-being of our country and its citizens. The health and social care sector is any organisation which provides healthcare support to people, for example hospitals, dentists and specialist support like physiotherapy and social care support and social workers in nursing homes and foster carers and in nurseries. The NHS is Britain's single biggest employer with over 350 different career pathways in both clinical and non-clinical roles and over 1.4 million employees from pharmacy and nursing to facilities and IT, occupational therapists to finance managers, paramedics to health informatics and public health careers. While social care specifically is about providing physical, emotional and social support and services to help people live and their lives, there is still a range of roles important to successful service delivery. Technological innovation and digital capabilities are beginning to transform the sector and the nature of the workforce. If you work in social care, you could help people in their own homes, in residential homes or in a number of other places, such as day centres or supported housing. And working in social care means supporting people with their non-clinical needs, although there is a really important crossover between working in health and working in social care, as we have all witnessed over this last year and as our panellists here today will attest to. 1.6 million people currently work in the social care sector and because of the increasing number of disabled younger adults living longer and the growing number of older people needing care, adult social care is growing and the sector needs at least another half a million jobs and people to do them by 2030. In fact, there are vacancies right now. Many staff now work in roles that cover both health and social care and the values and qualities needed are very similar. Recruitment and pathways are changing with degree and higher apprenticeships competing with university courses, conversion courses and on the job training, utilising transferable skills. So unlike many other sectors that are perhaps losing workers or are in decline because of socio-economic factors, the healthcare and social care field is growing rapidly. Dozens of health and social care careers have good or excellent job prospects, meaning finding a job is easier, offering long term employment prospects with real opportunities for promotion and progression, as well as job security. I'm going to introduce you today to our wonderful panellists who represent some of the careers on offer in the health and social care sector and have a breadth of experience and expertise in their industry that they will share with you today. Please do put your questions in the live Q&A chat and we will endeavour to ask these after the introductions. So first I'm going to kick off with Karen Stevens. Over to you. Thank you, thanks very much and good morning everybody and what a privilege it is to be able to talk to you about working in social care. That's what I'm going to focus on and just give you a bit of background in terms of my experience of working in social care. So when we're talking about social care, as Sarah has explained, it's all those services that allow people who 
perhaps need some care and support to live as independently as they can in their lives. We're very fortunate to be able to support older people, people who perhaps require because of their degree of learning disability, people who might have a physical disability but want to remain as independent as possible in the community. And a bit about my background, I work as a skills for care locality manager. And what that means is I work across Sussex and I help registered managers and you saw a little bit of information about who they might be and the sorts of careers they have in the video. And uh, my aim is to support them to recruit the right people and then to help them develop them and lead them effectively as they provide the services, whether they are care homes, people living in domiciliary in their own homes, people working in hospices, people who might be living in small houses or large housing associations to live independently. I actually decided I wanted to work in social care very early on and I went as a volunteer to see if I it was a sort of work I wanted to do and I volunteered in the local residential care home down the road from where I lived and I loved it and I was hooked and so what I decided to do was actually I wanted to develop as a nurse as well so I decided to go to university and develop it as a nurse and I became a mental health nurse um, I enjoyed working in the NHS for some time, but then I wanted actually to support people where they lived and that felt important. So I became a community based mental health nurse working for a charity. And what we did was an awful lot of supportive people living in their own environment. But of course, there can be people who are also homeless at that time. And so I did a lot of work working with people um, who were homeless, who perhaps felt a bit disadvantaged because of their mental health requirements and supporting them in day centres and community based services. I then decided I wanted to help train others in counselling and mental health support and so became a training and quality coordinator within a, a large charity. And what we did was really train people in counselling and supporting people in really uh, boosting people's confidence. And now what I do is do that with other managers so they can really help train and develop people. And I think the satisfaction I gain is every day is different in adult social care. And in fact, if you want to find out more about working in adult social care, I suggest you have a look at everydayisdifferent.com there's even a quiz you can take um, to say, am I the sort of person that could work in social care? And then you can look at some videos and examples of people who indeed do work in social care and then find out where the jobs are. So it's a great opportunity to really focus your time and attention. I think I've got the best out of social care because I've looked at those organisations that match my values and I feel so privileged to have had a great career in social care because choosing the right sort of organisations, taking whatever opportunity you can for training and development um, has led me to be able to support some very incredible people. And you've seen those people recently, how they've stepped up during the pandemic. So um, take the opportunities, look at adult social care as an opportunity and really focus on what matters to you. And so thank you for your time and attention and uh, very happy to take any questions as we go uh, with our other colleagues. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Karen. That's a, that, was, that was really interesting. Um, Charlotte, are you, are you ready to introduce yourself, please? Yes, no problem. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Charlotte or Charlie, either one's fine. <laughs> um, I am a NHS graduate management trainee on the graduate management trainee scheme. Um, I joined the scheme in March this year, um, which was a very interesting time to join, as I'm sure you can imagine after the pandemic. Um, so a bit about how I got into it. Um, I've been working for the last two years prior to that time in governance, um, clinical governance in the quality and safety department of UCLH. Um, and then went through quite a rigorous um, selection pro 
process to join the scheme. Um, and I'm now placed at Esht um, with um, my, one of my colleagues actually on the on the event today as well. So that's great. Um, working on a patient flow discharge transformation program type project. Um, the scheme is quite a um, different way of working to, let's say, more of a job role. Um, I'll be placed at ESCHT, which is East Sussex Healthcare Trust, for 12 months, and then I'll have a flexi placement of two months, and then I'll have um, a more strategic type placement in a CCG slash ICS role um, for about 10 months. And the scheme is um, obviously a graduate scheme. Um, it's open to uh, you know, graduates, I, I graduated in 2017, so I wasn't straight out of university, as I've said, um, but it's a really unique opportunity um, and the basic premise behind it is to help you grow your leadership skills, um, find out the kind of leader you want to be and um, also achieve a qualification as well in leadership management, so in sorry, healthcare leadership. Um, so you'll achieve a PDIP, so um, a, a proper qualification by the end of the two years, and then you can take that on um, to um, get a master's as well. So it's a really unique opportunity. Uh, I'm still at the very sort of beginning of it, um, but I'm really enjoying it um, so far. And you've got kind of the support from both your placements. So that would be East Sussex Healthcare Trust for me and the Leadership Academy, who sort of run the qualification side of things. Um, Yes, I think uh, my my degree background was actually in, in research in molecular biology, so um, this is, is slightly different and I'm really glad I went down this path in health and social care because um, I very much like a people person and I enjoy working with other people, even though it's a lot of it's virtual at the moment. Um, but research gave me a really good background for kind of starting out in the sort of sciences and um, Yes, yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to um, take any questions later on. Um, yeah, thank you. That's great. No, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you for telling us about, yes, you obviously started your, uh, as you say, your graduate placement at a very interesting time. Yes. Um, so now we're going to uh, move on to Neil. Um, Neil, are you happy to introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. Uh, good morning to all of you out there. Um, my name's Neil. Um, and uh, I'm a physiotherapist and I work at Eastbourne District General Hospital. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk to everybody about, you know, where physio fits in with kind of what's you're going to see is like how all the teams interact and it was really pertinent that Karen said earlier it's about kind of supporting people and literally all of the, the people that you're going to be hearing from today their teams and their roles come together uh, and overlap each other in so many ways whether that's in an acute hospital whether that's in a rehab unit whether that's in a care home whether it's helping a patient to stay independent in their in their own home so Physiotherapy, a lot of people hear about physiotherapists because they run onto the pitch with a magic sponge, but that's not the only career you can you can have in physio. Um, physios um, are probably one of the, the, the few, a bit like nurses, they can actually fit into every part of the health system, um, right from where patients come in at A&E to where they're on an orthopaedic ward, so they maybe had a, an injury or a broken bone that needs fixing or an operation, um, to people that have had brain injuries and had strokes or suffer from neurological conditions or have breathing problems. So we, we work as part of uh, ITU teams helping people in their, their rehab from, from certainly a lot recently COVID. Um, the area that I'm now in is musculoskeletal. So um, some of you may have come and, and, and met us MSK physios. If you've had a problem, you've gone to your doctor um, and then they will refer you in or you've been to see a consultant and they will refer you in. And it could be any part of your body. So back, neck, arm, shoulder, feet, hands, could be anything. So it's a really exciting and challenging role because it's up to me to try and work out what's wrong with you and then convince you I know what I'm doing so that you can get better. And it's all about giving people and patients their responsibility to, to manage their own health choices and to get better and become independent. Um, so 
how did I become a physio? So I had a career beforehand in business finance and it wasn't, it didn't tick all the boxes for me. I wanted to make a difference. Um, so in my uh, early 30s, I went to university and um, I had a little daughter of nine months old and my son was born in the exams in the second year. And I did my physio degree and then I started uh, at Eastbourne Hospital. And as a junior physio, you do lots, what we call rotations. So you've been spend six months in an area. So you might be the orthopedic wards, so the broken bones or on a stroke ward um, and working on ITU and you build up all your skills. And then as you become a bit more proficient, you can become a more senior physio. And at that point, you can then decide which is the one that you really enjoy doing. Um, so some people really want to work with children. So there's paediatric physios. Some people really like to work in the community so they can go and help people stay independent in their own homes. Um, I really enjoyed the, the neurology side uh, and, the, and the stroke, but I ended up becoming a musculoskeletal physio. So that, as I said, is any part of the body. And I'm now responsible for the team here at, uh, at Eastbourne. And I work with uh, all the team leads from Hastings all the way up to Uckfield and all the way over to Rye. And I'm really passionate about my guys, no matter what level they're at, coming in and taking responsibility and learning is you never can know enough in this role you're the more you learn the more you realize you don't understand so um, it's always about in, being inquisitive and, and asking that next question so if you if you amazed by the human body like I am then you've got the basis for being a physiotherapist the next things you've got to add in are your communication skills um, and they're really really key because you won't talk to your friends at school like you talk to your teachers and you won't talk to your teachers like you do to your parents so it's always learning about how you adjust your communication skills to be able to get across what you want to say to people um, and the, the best way to kind of get an experience because the NHS is a really busy and fast paced environment is to try and get some work experience to do some voluntary work to go and work in a, a, in a, a nursing home. If you know physios, if you can go and just see what it is they have to do because it's um, you want to know that it's the it's the right course for you and to access it um, you can either uh, if you're if you're still at school is do do your a levels and and then do a degree and there's lots of universities across the country i went to the university of brighton and all the physiotherapy is taught in eastbourne so we get a lot of physiotherapy students coming via here and it's really good to for, for um, um kind of those youngsters coming through to really get that experience before they then qualify as a physio and, and decide which areas they want to go into. But the if you're looking for more information on careers, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy website has some really, really good information on what physio does, how it works and how you can access it. Um, in terms of challenges, you never know what the next day is going to bring. So um, I've been in musculoskeletal physio for uh, seven or eight years, but with the pandemic, we all got asked if we could go and do other things. So um, January and February, I then I spent my time up on the intensive care unit again with the, the, the really poorly people with COVID. And it was amazing to see how many other physios who had gone on to do specialities then ended up coming back and working in the hospital and, and how that teamwork works. And it is all about teamwork. But if you if you like a challenge, you like the human body and you and you like to ask the question why and inspire people to get better, then definitely physio is the, the, the course you want to take. Great. Thank you ever so much, Neil. That was really, really interesting and interesting to hear. There are lots of questions coming in through the chat. So do keep um, putting your questions in the chat. We're going to come to them after everyone's done their introduction. So you can put them in at any time. Sometimes we uh, will be answering them in the chat as we go along as well. But now I'd like to introduce you to Naomi, Naomi Fazell. Hi everyone, um, I'm Naomi Filsall. I'm a practice manager with East Sussex County Council Learning Disability Services. Um, I started working in social care when I was about 18 years old uh, as a support worker, working uh, mainly with older people and then later on with people with learning disabilities. I really, really enjoyed the work. I really loved the variety, meeting lots of different people, uh, working with uh, lots of different staff teams. I worked in different sites as well, different different homes. 
um, as a relief support worker. So I was on like a bank list covering people's shifts. Um, at the time for me, it fitted in perfectly. I was at university studying um, and working in care is very flexible. I was able to get lots of shifts in the evenings or weekends and particularly over holiday periods. Um, so I, I was able to work uh, within the services then. Um, East Sussex County Council then supported me to complete a master's degree in social work, which I completed in 2004. Um, and after that, I worked as a social worker with the learning disability team um, in Hastings. It was a joint uh, health and social care team at the time, and um, we worked uh, very closely and shared office spaces with our speech and language therapy colleagues, um, OTs, uh, physios um, and uh, learning disability nurses as well. Um, uh, after a couple of years, I became a senior practitioner for the assessment uh, social work team and then a uh, practice manager of the team another few years later. Um, when I had my first child, I wanted to work a bit nearer to home, so I moved to uh, another a generic assessment team. They're now called the Neighbourhood Support Teams um, uh, to manage the social work team there. I um, It's a generic team, so we were supporting people with mental health needs, uh, learning difficulties, uh, maybe substance misuse issues um, as well. Again, very working closely with our health colleagues. Um, we were co-located with our OTs, um, which gave it a, a really strong and kind of holistic approach to supporting um, our clients. Um, I spent three years in that role and then I moved to my current role working within learning disability services. Um, I'm responsible for providing management support to the East Sussex Shared Lives Scheme and East Sussex Supported Accommodation Scheme. Um, I also provide some management support to our respite services for people with learning disabilities. Uh, we support people in lots of different settings um, to gain skills, develop um, their independence. We provide people to uh, participate in daily activities, getting out and about social opportunities, um, as well as providing that support to families and carers who may need a break. Um, I've talked lots to young people um, at various careers events. That, that's also part of my role is getting out and talking to people about working in social care. Um, and what I hear a lot is people saying they're not sure that it's for them because they're not sure they want to spend a day feeding people or taking them to the toilet. Um, and I have lots of conversations about working in social care is so much more than that. Um, there are so many more opportunities um, of roles and different things that you can do within the sector. We have services which provide support um, to people to go out and about, to join clubs, to do their shopping, um, socialise at the pub, go to gigs and bouncy bands at the weekends, uh, day services, people are baking, computing, um, as well as getting out and about in the community. Um, some of our service users do need um, some personal care and they may need some help with, with eating and, and drinking, um, but the job is so much wider than that. It's, 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 there's so much more to it. Um, it, working within our services, is it's varied, it's flexible, it's a really, really rewarding job. Um, you gain lots and lots of transferable skills, as some of my colleagues on the panel have already said, that, that um, will carry you forward into future roles. Um, I've worked for the council for 20 years now, and it's provided me with lots of opportunities uh, to develop my career. Um, the council is a very large employer. Um, has lots and lots of services, uh, so it's very easy to try new things, to move to different teams and to try different roles. Um, I would say that if you want to make a difference to people in people's lives, you like working with people and I think it's already been mentioned as well. If you're good at communicating, you're a good communicator. Maybe you're looking for something flexible at the moment in terms of studying as well or a varied job, um, opportunities to try new roles within the care sector. Um, working within uh, East Sussex County Council, you'll receive high, very high level of training. We have our in-house training um, department, <coughs> sorry, and um, they'll support you with your own personal development within your career. Um, then I would definitely say to consider uh, giving it a go and um, a career in social care with, with, with the council. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Nemi. That was that was really interesting. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Jacob now. Um, Jacob, are you ready? Say hello. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. 
Is that right? So, I, so I, I'm Jake and I'm, um, I work for the NHS with the East Sussex Health Trust and I'm currently studying podiatry and an apprenticeship at Brighton University. This is a bit of a change for me because I originally studied zoology with marine zoology um, but I found it difficult to get work in that sector back then um, so I ended up doing lots of different jobs after university. That's when I ended up working as a healthcare assistant with the district nurses and that's where I started gaining all my health experience and uh, going to the health sector. Um, so a podiatrist really, um, it's not the first kind of career you always think of sometimes, but um, it's basically you're a foot specialist and you do anything from the knee down. Um, and they cover very various different areas. Um, so you can either specialise in those areas or do a range of all of them. Um, there's advanced wound care. Um, so we get a lot of uh, uh, diabetics that have uh, wounds that need uh, proper dressings and debriding with scalpels. Um, it's extremely interesting in this area and you need quite a vast knowledge. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I've, I've shadowed in and been watching some of the podiatrists that specialise in this area and it's extremely interesting. Um, and you work alongside consultants and diabetic nurses. Um, there's nail surgery. So if you're in, into a bit of minor surgery, um, we get patients coming in that have been grown toenails and uh, we'll partially remove the nails from either side under local anaesthetic. Uh, sometimes remove the whole nail, so that's extremely interesting as well. Um, and I've been helping out at the moment while I'm at university. Um, uh, but the main thing we normally do is nail care and callus debridement. So um, for, for different medical reasons, uh, some people can't cut their nails anymore. Um, so we help with that. And also they're at high risk of um, getting infections if they cut themselves. So we make sure that we, we're doing it properly and um, helping with that. Um, and we also uh, we do debridement, which means removing uh, you know dry skin from under the feet um, because they might be in a lot of pain. So we help with that as well and just make them more comfortable, really. Then there's a the muscular skeletal side. Uh, um, so we have muscular skeletal podiatrists that specialise in the feet and the lower limbs. Um, so you'll get people coming in with pains and injuries, and um, and the muscular skeletal podiatrist will try and um, give them exercises to help relieve this pain or um, design special insoles uh, to go in their shoes, which might help them correct their feet and um, help them walk properly again. Um, so a little bit about the podiatry apprenticeship. Um, I'm employed by the East Sussex Health Trust where I do all my clinical hours. Um, I do all my lectures at university with the other students, um, but I would do all my clinical hours to, to finish my degree and all the hours I need to do for each module. Um, I do all my clinical hours with the trust. So I get a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one attention with the podiatrists. Uh, much more than the other students will be getting because they're kind of shared with uh, a lecture at the university and I get much more experience working with patients and practicing my skills. So it's a great opportunity to do that and I would definitely recommend trying the apprenticeship route if you can get on that. Thank you Jacob, that, that was great, thank you. So a different, a different alternative route to um, a kind of graduate scheme and a degree apprenticeship scheme. Um, I'm just going to pass you on to Shannon. Uh, Shannon, are you ready to go? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so my route uh, might be a bit different from uh, people who uh, previously spoke as well. Um, so I did my uh, Bachelor of Science in Biology and Psychology in Canada um, and then moved over to England to do my Master's in Mental Health um, at King's College. So initially I thought, um, you know, I want to be a clinical psychologist. That's the, you know, the route I want to take. I know what the job involves. Like that's 100% what I want to do. Um, for anyone who has looked into that route, they'll know that getting an assistant psychology post is quite difficult. Um, so I interned for a bit in a mental health trust. Um, which was really, really interesting and really enlightening and learned loads by doing that, which eventually led me on to <clears throat> doing an assistant psychologist post and a senior assistant psychologist post. Um, those were really interesting and I did do a lot of, you know, what you think of when you think of psychology, um, which is more about uh, low level therapy. Um, but actually, in doing that role, I found out that I actually liked learning about the service development um, part better. So in terms of how they bring together services and and, um, you know, uh, teach people how to um, uh, improve things uh, so that services can get better and things like that. So I changed 
tacked with that. Spoke to a lot of different people who worked um, in that trust about, you know, their own, I guess what you guys are listening to today in terms of learning about that. And a lot of people gave me advice about, um, which I'll give to you now, about learning skill set instead of an actual role. So if you can learn a lot of different types of areas, um, it will help you progress in your career, whatever that may be as well, um, which was quite useful to me. So like Charlotte, I did um, a background in um, clinical governance or clinical audit, uh, which then led me on to working in quality improvement, which is basically helping to support people that, um, you know, people on the ground who are working in uh, different services like Neil in physiotherapy or Jacob in podiatry um, and supporting those services to uh, make improvements within their services. So it's kind of a more broad uh, type role where you're not just working in one area, <clears throat> you're helping to support people across the whole hospital um, to improve. So in that way, it's really interesting and you get to work on a lot of different things at once. Um, after that, I kind of moved into where I am now. There's a lot of buzzwords, so I don't want to overwhelm people with that, but um, there's a lot of uh, different roles with different names in them, including things like strategy, quality improvement, transformation and operations and program and project management. So there's a lot of different um, type roles that kind of include the same skill sets um, uh, that would be useful to people. Um, and in doing that, uh, what I do now is basically look at um, making improvements in hospital and patient flow, which basically is moving people, you know, how people get into the hospital, um, where they stay, where is best place for them to go and how they get out of the hospital, uh, which includes working with a lot of stakeholders in the system, such as Naomi, uh, you know, people in adult social care and other system sectors um, to support them and also working on discharges, which um, impacts on flow. So that's what I do at the moment. It's a really highly varied career. You get to work with a lot of different people. Um, and one of the main positives of that is that you're working um, not just on a small scale. So thinking about, you know, improvement and data for the improvement you're making, but you're also thinking uh, long term and uh, strategic thinking in terms of, you know, what does this service need to look like in five years time or a year's time? So it's a lot of um, thinking, but a lot of doing as well. So um, I find it really interesting and just wanted to give you guys some advice about that. Um, and another thing is about I think we a lot of us spoke about the types of um, skills and I see in the Q&A section people are talking about some soft skills that would help people and things like that. I definitely subscribe to the belief about a growth mindset. So when I was younger, I was quite shy. Anyone who knows me now would not think that, but um, I definitely was. Um, so I think, you know, you can learn those things as you go in terms of communication and uh, networking and, you know, being good with people and things like that. You can definitely learn that along the way. So um, just to let people out there know. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Shannon. Now, I think we're just gonna quickly pass to Harry, who I think we have managed to get online. So over to you, Harry, for a quick intro, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Harry. I'm a primary care workforce planner in the NHS, and I have a background in uh, staff planning, having previously worked as a scheduler, capacity planner, and a workforce manager in a call center. Um, I worked in several companies in, in several countries as, uh, as well, and um, I'm originally Dutch and started my career in, uh, in Holland, then worked in France, and before moving to the UK, I worked in, uh, in Germany. Um, I started working for the NHS last year, and I was hired to work in a project management team to assist uh, with the creation of a workforce plan for general practice in the Sussex region, which basically means uh, GP practices. Um, the NHS is constantly changing and the most recent change is the introduction of 14 new roles in GP practices, 
to reduce the workload of GPs and nurses, of which we already have um, shortages. And these additional roles, like for instance, podiatrists, dietitians, paramedics, mental health practitioners, are subsidized by the NHS, uh, but practices have a maximum budget which they can spend on different roles. Um, so they need to make choices on who to hire. And that's where uh, we come in as a workforce planning team. We look at the recruitment plans uh, for which the practices um, communicated uh, to us. And we evaluate the need for certain roles. Uh, we report on possible risks and uh, come up with action plans. So, for instance, when a lot of practices uh, would um, want to hire dietitians, we will uh, report this to Health Education England and warn them of possible uh, shortages in, uh, in the coming years. We will come up with a plan on how to make sure we will have enough uh, dietitians in the future. And such a plan can be, for instance, to increase uh, places in universities, or we might be able to reschool certain professions to fill uh, a short term gap. So that all depends on um, on where we see that uh, the issues will uh, will arise. Um, a lot of work goes into analyzing large amounts of uh, of workforce data and as a workforce planner, uh, I'm always looking at the current workforce. So do we have enough people with the right is workforce balanced uh, in age, for instance? Uh, do we have a lot of people who are close to retirement? So that can be a risk. Um, we look at the demand. Uh, in this case, uh, with GP practices, they are their own companies. So uh, we cannot uh, uh, let them recruit people, but we can advise them. And uh, we look at training. Are there sufficient training facilities and placements in the region to support the current and the future demand? Um, the last part is the future workforce where we uh, focus on, and that is uh, what kind of growth do we expect and how we, can we exist? Uh, how can we assist in making sure that we have the right people uh, at the right time with the right skills to do the job? Thank you very much. Great, thank you ever so much, Harry. That's really helpful. So hopefully you've been introduced to quite a wide variety of um, guests here today, some clinical, some non-clinical, um, in health and in social care. So I'm just going to go through the questions that we've got in uh, in the panel. So um, some of the panelists have actually answered it in the Q and A, but I think it would be helpful if we could um, uh, talk about it as well. So, um, Karen, I think you had the first question, which was um, around kind of how many people are in your team, how many you manage, and what you think are the key skills you need in your job. Um, are you able to respond to yeah. that, Karen? Of course, thank you. I would describe myself currently as a project worker, so I don't directly line manage people, although I have done that through my career. What I'm more about is influencing and linking with a lot of people across the patch of Sussex to make sure that we attract people into the social care, that we provide them the right opportunities to develop, uh, be that modules or qualifications and that also managers are able to lead effectively and you can imagine the demands on social care at the moment that is key i think the key skills i have is probably being an independent project manager is that independent working that's one of my key skills and keeping myself motivated and linked lots of communications and presentation skills huge amounts of digital requirements now as you can imagine and um, an ability to really make sure that um, we treat people with respect and as a whole person so they get the right sort of service and support wherever they may be. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Karen. Um, and Neil, I just wondered if you would kind of um, just talk through your answer that you put in the in the Q and A related to kind of like um, what are the soft skills that you think are, are you need in your job? Yeah, absolutely happy to do that. Um, 
listening, active listening. Um, a lot of time patients have come and they may have been to see a, a GP or a consultant and, and those uh, professions have a really limited amount of time. So we may be the first time or the first person that the patient has seen that we can spend half an hour with or 45 minutes uh, with. So if a patient is going to trust you and believe you, um, if you've listened to their story, then actually you're going to get them on board. So really listening to people and what they're saying. And also people don't always say what they want to say. It's picking up the bits in between. So the body language um, and all of those things where they might not feel they can tell you, but you can tease it out. Um, communicating skills. So as I said, you know, you won't talk to your teachers like you talk to your parents and you won't talk to your parents like you talk to your friends. So there's different levels and abilities of how you direct your, your language and, and how you talk to people. Um, and you have to judge the person in front of you and how they're going to best receive the message you want to put over. Um, and never stop caring. Um, it, you can get some fatigue within this industry because you, you hear a lot of sad stories. Um, so it's always having being able to kind of protect yourself, but always come across as caring because it's about that patient and their journey and keeping them as active and independent as, as possible. Thank you very much. In a way, quite sounds like quite similar skills to what Karen was talking about as well, uh, placing across the sectors. Um, We've had some uh, questions in the chat about kind of qualifications and GCSEs, which I know Charlotte, you've responded to. So I wondered if you could just talk that through a little bit and then Jacob, we could just maybe go to you as well in terms of your apprenticeship. So Charlotte, would you be able to answer that? Yes, sure. So um, I've had a few questions about um, A-levels and GCSEs. Um, so, oh, yeah, sorry, think can you hear me now? Yes. yes. OK, um, yes, yeah, so there's a few questions about um, A-levels and GCSEs. Um, obviously, they're two different levels. So I think um, the, the A-levels that I did were um, maths, chemistry and biology. And the reason I chose those was because actually at the time I was um, aiming to go into medicine. Um, obviously, medicine is a uh, that's a sort of degree where you, you need that they tell you um, on the university website, you know, you need A levels in this with these grades. So if you have a specific thing that you're aiming for, like medicine or um, nursing, physiotherapy, something like that, the, the, the what you want to do is go to the source, um, which is the apprenticeship or the training scheme or the degree website and they'll tell you what it is that you need and then you can kind of work backwards. So, you know, if I need these A levels, Maybe I want to think about these GCSEs um, and that's a good way to start. And another thing that I mentioned in the chat is um, if you can talk to as many people, honestly, as many people as possible who are working in the sector or, um, or have been through the process or are currently at university, maybe or in an apprenticeship um, about how they got into it and how they found it. Um, and you'll often find that lots of people are in positions that they didn't think they'd be in. So it takes you in lots of different directions um, and that's also great. Um, that's also a really good idea. And then the last thing I'd mention is, yes, qualifications really, really important. And definitely talk to your anyone in your school who has or college who's at like a career advisor or anything like that, because it's their job to keep up to date on these things. Um, but the last thing I'd say is get some work experience. It can be a week, it can be a couple of days, it can be like evening stuff, um, but get yourself into the role, see if you actually like it before you put a lot of time and effort into trying really hard to get somewhere. Um, you know, obviously there might be restrictions on what you can and can't see at this point, but um, people will be but this is the great thing about the sector. People are really keen to have you come and see what they do. So take advantage of it and yeah, you'll you'll find something that you love. That's great. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, Jacob, could you just briefly briefly say um, how you found out about your apprenticeship? Because there's a kind of maybe a perception that apprenticeships are in more kind of traditional trades and actually degree apprenticeships are kind of relatively new development. Um, if you could just briefly say how you found out about yours and 
Yeah, so I was working as a healthcare assistant originally of the district nurses and um, I spoke to a podiatrist in the community and it interested me what they did and I was into wound care at the time so I, um, I asked them how I could get into it. They said that there was an apprenticeship every year that they take on one every year as an apprentice podiatrist. So I emailed the lead podiatrist at the time and just said I'm interested in podiatry, can I do some shadowing or can I get involved and um, they told me to apply for the apprenticeship. So I think having the skills as a healthcare assistant already been working as a health professional, that's always a big plus for them because that's what they're looking for. Because it can be quite competitive. Um, I think 50 people went for my position, they only take on one. So you've, you've got to really stand out. So I think you need to, you know, get that experience. Um, yeah, so maybe work as a health professional before and try and get in somewhere into the health profession. Um, and I think also my previous degree probably helped as well because it showed that I, I can really study at university. Um, so it was going to benefit them, um, knowing that I would probably be a safe candidate. So I would say, yeah, do well in your A levels and then, um, yeah, try and get some experience really, because that's what they're looking for. Great, thank you ever so much. Um, Naomi, we've got a question in the chat, which actually I know Karen has answered in the chat, but I wondered if you had anything more you'd like to add. Um, it, it took, um, someone has mentioned that you know her mother works in care and she doesn't actually have any specific qualifications in care and that you could normally just get a job. Um, is she right um, and is it worth doing a course? Um, I wondered if you would like to kind of add to what Karen has said in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah absolutely. Um, yes that, that, that she's right um, in terms of entry level support worker roles we don't require um, any specific qualifications um, work, workers are then supported to gain the care certificate qualification whilst working with us um, and obviously that may go on to other things in terms of registered managers awards and management roles um, equally obviously I was working um, within the care sector as a support worker myself whilst I was studying at university and similar as Jacob was saying um, I then used the experience that I'd gained working in care and my previous degree to get onto a master's degree relating to social work um, so I think absolutely in terms of coming in and giving it a go and having a look at the jobs and trying things out you don't need particular qualifications um, what you may see then is as different roles uh, different pathways that then you may subsequently need that but certainly having the initial experience of working in a sport worker role will stand you in really good stead give you those transferable skills and give you an idea of what you might like to do great thank you so that's shown different options there and a way of like testing the water and seeing if you like what like that kind of activity um, Shannon, I know you've answered the question in the chat as well, but it might be helpful for you just to um, uh, share a little bit more on screen um, about how COVID has affected your role and what you do. Yeah, so as people can imagine, so I, I thought that question might appear um, when I said about flow and um, hospital working. Um, so yeah, it's been quite challenging um, as people can imagine um, in terms of flow in the hospital. Um, so our teams, obviously the whole hospitals um, have had to make changes to the way that they practice and um, to make sure that patients are safe, to make sure that we adhere to uh, what's best for staff and patients um, and that includes you know things like social distancing, we still need to do that in the hospital um, as well in addition to making sure that we communicate really well with um, other providers and organizations we work with in terms of onward care so uh, making sure that you know for care homes that we communicate about patients leaving and what they do need um, to know um, and also things like um, swab tests and things like that so it's been it's been really um, uh, you know challenging at times and uh, still is um, but actually really um, good good work that's needed and also in terms of uh, career it's quite exciting in terms of um, fast paced if you like that way of working so um, so yeah it's been challenging but quite quite good to, to learn and um, help support um, the healthcare sector during this important time. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank, thank you for answering that. 
Um, I noticed that Matt Hancock is under the scr scrutiny today in terms of how the pandemic was um, has been handled by the government. So uh, be interesting to see what he says. Um, Harry, you've got, there's some questions that come your way, and I know you have responded a little bit in the chat. But one of the and I might ask you this as well, Karen, actually, after Harry. And um, what are the roles that you see are more desired now? So where are the kind of opportunities, um, Harry? I just wondered if you, you had any. I would like to shed some light on that and then I might just go to Karen afterwards. Yeah, um, definitely on top of the list, uh, clinical pharmacists and care coordinators uh, within uh, the GP practices. And um, also there's a there's a high demand of for uh, first contact physiotherapists and social prescribing link workers. Oh, OK, can you would you just explain what that last one was social subscribing? Social prescribing link workers. Link so they, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so in in a way, what we see in uh, in GP practices is that um, a lot of GP practices choose the the professions that they know, and um, that's where we come in to kind of uh, help them with uh, making a balanced decision because a lot of uh, professions work together. If you have a care coordinator, you would like to have a social prescribing link worker as well in your practice so that they can work together as a team. Um, and you see that um, uh, throughout the, um, the, the practices itself, uh, the cooperation between practices will also uh, elevate because there might be uh, practices which are um, uh, working on one um, in, in one certain area and a group of practices which goes in another area. So that's what we're trying to promote to get a balanced uh, team for the whole community. Okay. Thank you. And I know we you have shared the I think you said the how many role the new roles and new positions that are coming through to GP. So we'll make sure we share them all in the chat as well. And yeah. um, that would be great. So Karen, I just wondered if you would like to add anything from a kind of social care perspective in terms of where the gaps and opportunities are. Yeah, I think Naomi put it very well the the care and support worker is vital in social care. And what we're increasingly seeing is they need a huge range of skills, expertise and the right values. So I think that that's a that's a really expanding area. And as you heard colleagues talk about moving from acute health needs to more community based, we're needing people that can support people wherever they are and provide the sorts of care, whatever that might be. So that generic health and social care support is much needed. I also wanted to highlight nurses in social care. We've got 30,000 nurses working across England in social care, and that's a really big demand need. And, and we have 1,600 nurses in social care in Sussex. There's careers for nurses in social care. And of course, there's a new role called the nursing associate, which is a really exciting role that you can develop as an apprentice as well. So there's lots of opportunities. Thank you, Sharon. Very, Sarah. That's great. Thank you very much. Karen. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, ask, um, and I think I'm going to go to uh, maybe Naomi and Shannon, so maybe you Shannon first, is kind of what do you think are the most important skills or experiences you might look for when recruiting? What would you be looking for? So uh, there's, how much time do we have, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> um, Two so minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a lot of skills within my career. So first and foremost, um, organizational skills um, and making sure that um, when you're working on projects that you're actually, you know, working to time and not missing anything. So I'm sure loads of people on this call would say that say that as well. Um, in addition, I do a lot of um, data analysis, but not to scare people. I, I sucked at maths at school. So literally it's more about it's more about, you know, um, uh, if you can read a chart and, you know, make a chart in Excel, it's kind of like that level. So um, people don't be scared about that. Um, and also one of the main things is about being t teachable and kind of like a self starter. So if you're someone who, you know, sits back and uh, kind of likes people to tell them what they need to do, that's probably probably not going to be um, the career that I'm, I'm speaking about. So it's more about kind of, you know, uh, if there's a challenge, do you kind of look for stuff yourself in order to uh, make improvements and uh, will you speak to people and start start to do things on your own instead of, um, you know, 
kind of waiting for people to tell you tell you what to do in that respect. So there, there's a lot of different there's a lot of different things. Um, let me see. I think I wrote a lot down, so I just wanted to check if I was looking for that. But yeah, I think those are the main things and just being open to learning because um, there's always something new coming around around the way. So just be o be open, be open and teachable. So yeah, right. thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So Naomi, I'm just going to ask you that question very briefly because we've only got about four minutes left and I want to just give you all a chance to um, do your last question I'm going to ask. So Naomi, have you got anything to add in terms of what you might be looking for in terms of um, skills or attitudes when you're recruiting? Um, yes, we're, we're, we're always looking for personal qualities, um, more like your personal attributes, not so much. The skills we can help you to learn we can teach you in terms of training the skills that you need to do the job but what we need is those kind of personal qualities of really wanting to support people wanting to make a difference being interested in being with people understand wanting to understand uh, different people and their different needs um it's those kind of qualities we we really value great thank you well we've only got about two or three minutes left i know we've got uh, Priory School Airhouse Massive have been putting loads of questions in the chat here. So um, I'm going to ask each of you um, if you, I'm just going to go around in order, um, if you could just say one thing you most enjoy about your job and one top tip for getting into your industry. And then if you think Brexit has affected your role in any way or not, but that might be very short because we haven't got a long time. So if we, Karen, are you, would you be able to go first? So the one thing you enjoy about your job, one top tip and has Brexit affected your role? Um, most enjoyed is the contact with the fabulous people, like minded, fabulous people that want to support people. Top tip, just as Naomi was saying, don't be put off if you haven't got various qualifications and training. Think about what matters to you, your values and check the organisations you work with match those values. Brexit to a degree has affected social care because we have to think about who we recruit. Um, so I've done a lot of activity to support people around recruitment at this time. And I think that's probably the biggest impact. Thank Great, you. Great, thank you. Well answered. Didn't get a Brexit question on the other panel. Um, OK, Charlotte, I'm going to go to you. Um, would you be able to answer that? One thing you enjoy, top tip, and has Brexit affected your role? Yes, sure. So um, the scheme that I'm on at the moment and in the role that I'm doing, I'm literally learning something new every single day, which I love. Um, that's perfect for me. And it's a it's a really steep learning curve. But as I said in the chat, I'm getting used to um, getting things wrong and it being OK and learning from it. So that's great. Um, top tip for getting into the industry. So um, this is a great industry for people who are curious and want to ask questions, especially when they're hard to ask. So that's that's a great thing if you like to do that i'd say as early as you can get your hands dirty and get in there and try it it's so important to understand what it is you like about it um and that will really kind of um define your moving forward in the industry um is actually if you like it um in terms of brexit um i'm actually just going to say no from my perspective and in my role it actually hasn't affected me yet um, but I'll keep you posted <laughs> if things change. <laughs> Great, thank you. OK, so we're going to try and keep everybody brief because I know actually you've probably got a lot to say about this. But so, Neil, if I go to you. <laughs> you know me well. Yeah. Um, what do I love most about it? No, no two days are the same. No two patient, patients are the same. So you're you're you never get bored doing it. Um, no, I don't think uh, Brexit has affected us. Covid has affected us far more and, and getting us to think in new ways of how we deliver physiotherapy. Um, so we now do video consultations. We now do phone consultations, which is taking us down a very different route. And that's uh, that's going to be a one for the future. Um, top tip, get, get some work experience working with people. Um, in healthcare or in a restaurant, but practice those communication skills. Great, that's fantastic. Thank you. So Naomi, I'm going to go to you next. If you could briefly give your top yep. tips, what you enjoy and if you think Brexit's affected you. OK, um, uh, favourite thing definitely is being working with people, all the people I work with, other professionals, my colleagues, all the clients that we work with. 
you can't um, underestimate that really positive impact that we can all working together have on um, on our clients' lives. Um, it's, 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 fan, it's fantastic. Uh, top tip, I would just say give it a go. We've got lots of different services. You, if you don't particularly like one role, you may like another. You may not want to work in a day service, but you might want to work in the community. There's, there's so many different roles within social care that just give it a go. There's lots of jobs available as well. Lots of things out there. We're always recruiting. Um, so yeah, just, just give it a try. Um, and in terms of Brexit, not not particularly. I haven't thought much about Brexit because it's all been about COVID and doing meetings <laughs> across teams. So at some point I'll get my favourite thing back, which will actually be meeting the people in person. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I think um, COVID probably did um, put, kick Brexit into the back back waters as such. Um, Jacob, have you got time for a quick quick top tip and what you most enjoy about your job? Yeah, so the best thing about my job has got to be patient interaction um, and at the end of the treatment knowing that you've improved their quality of life. Top tip would be, again, we, I know we keep saying it, but get some medical experience if it's working in a hospital or a healthcare, as a healthcare assistant or doing shadowing or voluntary work um, before you commit to that health profession and um, just get that valuable experience. And Brexit, yeah, I haven't really noticed if it's affected us either, to be honest. Um, again, yeah, COVID's been taken over, taken over, yeah, everything really. So. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've got Shannon and Harry. So Shannon, a quick top tip and uh, what you enjoy. Yeah. So in terms of um, what I enjoy, obviously that's um, making improvements for um, the whole hospital. So it's on a, a really large scale and um, making things better for patients and staff. And then in terms of a uh, top tip, it would be in addition to what everyone said about getting you know, experience, it would be finding a good uh, mentor or coach, uh, just someone who believes in you and will support you in your learning along the way as well. Great, thank you. And Harry, Harry, you're our last, our last top tip and what you enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoy um, working with people. I enjoy uh, crunching numbers and uh, making graphs and, and explaining uh, what they all mean. And my top tip would be um, go travel and talk to people. Uh, experience other cultures. Don't uh, sit just on the beach, but have a talk with uh, the guy who works behind the bar or in the restaurant or wherever you can you can find people that's that really especially within the nhs um it it really is a, a a group of people which with very different uh backgrounds and uh it will tremendously uh help you in your career if you get that social um social factor in uh brexit has definitely uh affected uh us in that sense that um we are no longer able to um to get people uh, well, to get the, uh, the different professions easily from uh, from Europe itself. So when we have shortages in dietitians, for instance, uh, it's no longer that easy to uh, to get them working uh, in England. So it has an effect. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I hope we've managed to answer as many questions as possible that have been coming through the chat. We the, this uh, will be recorded, so it will be put up on the East Sussex uh, Careers Hub site. Um, I think about the 14th of June or mid June. Um, so you'll be able to share it again with any any of your students for the teachers that are online here. I just wanted to say a really big thank you to everyone on our panel. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope we've managed to give you some insight into the opportunities that are out there in health and social care. So thank you very much and goodbye. Bye bye.